I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. So I'm here with Mick Eveling. Mick, how's it going? Excellent, thank you. Mick, I have to tell you something. I'm kind of ashamed to be sitting here with you. <laughs> like, I feel like you go out there and, like, I'll just give some stories and you could add some other stories. I'm going to ask you about other stories. But, like, you'll go to the Sudan and find a boy whose arms have been blown off in a warm zone and literally 3D print him new arms and now he can feed himself again so this is the sort of thing you do on a deal you like like the the artist i don't know how to say his name tempt tempty yeah, tempt tempt you took the art this artist with als you gave him a way to communicate again to create his art again by almost kind of a quasi artificial eyes you've done all of these incredible things you literally go around the world saving the world and i'm like i seriously i'll look at those situations and i'll say oh that's horrible there, but for the grace of God, go I. And I just leave the situation. But you go into the situation and, like, solve the problem. So I kind of want to dive into, A, what problems can be solved that we're somehow not solving, but B, why are you doing this? And and really, I can respect the fact that you're doing it, and I wish I was more like that, and we'll discuss that. I want to be more like that. And so maybe maybe kind of, like, reel back a little bit, like, how, how did you, you're also a big like movie producer, movie production. You do all that stuff. You sold a company in the 90s. We have some intersection there. I know uh, you sold a company. Well, tell me the name of your book. The name of the book is Not Impossible, The Art and Joy of Doing What Couldn't Be Done. And Mick, I also want to say you're my favorite superhero. So let's dive right into how you got your superhuman abilities. Let's do it. Start at the beginning. <laughs> what's, what's your secret origin? Every superhero has a secret origin. What's your secret origin? I've never been asked that question before. That's a good question. Uh, I would say it comes from, you know, it's a fairly literal answer, but it comes from kind of how I was brought up by my mom and dad. Where'd you grow up? Uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I was born in California. I'm a native Californian. Grew up in in Phoenix. But I, th I would say one of the things that I can remember growing up, and I had, I think I had a, a lovely, lovely childhood, would be these meetings that would happen in our house. And my brother and I would, you know, would walk by, would get up in our pajamas and go to the kitchen to get a glass of water and then go back. And there would be all these adults in this room and they'd be talking. And 
you know, what I know now looking back is that was the, uh, these meetings that my mom and dad would host and it would be usually the start of some kind of a charity or some kind of a, a thing that they were trying to do that was doing some good. Uh, they were very involved with their church and they were very involved with things, you know, that were that were altruistic, but I didn't know what that, that word meant at the it, time. It seems like you took that to another level, which is not just starting a charity, but I call this micro charity where you find like a specific situation and as you put it, you do it yourself. You go in and solve the situation as opposed to just writing a check for like a thousand dollars to some charity and hoping that they solve cancer. You go in and cure cancer or whatever you do. So well that and that's that's incredibly strategic and intentional because one of the the many mantras that we have, we have a, we have a couple of mantras that we live by. And one of those is help one, help many. And the reason that I look through that lens and I look through that kind of approach on how to to create real change is that if I said to you, hey, James, um, so I'm going to pitch you on helping me with something today. You ready? Here we go. Do you want to help me cure hunger? Yes. Do you know how to do that? No. Okay. Next solve, question. Solve corruption in, in African governments. Right. So now if I say to you, hey, James, um, when I was coming in today for the podcast, there was a guy downstairs. Looks like he hadn't eaten for a while. Do you have five bucks? Give me five bucks. I'll, I'll put in five bucks. And there was a, we'll go get him a, a, a sandwich from the bodega downstairs. Okay, here's five bucks. Here's five bucks. <laughs> exactly. That's a doable, quantifiable, achievable thing that you do. And now all of a sudden, there's momentum, right? And if you start to have that momentum going forward, then maybe tomorrow you say, you know, I'm going to do that again. I want to drill down on that because Cut. you get a certain excitement from giving, and I think everybody would, but you really figure out how to almost put that excitement in a can to give you momentum for the next day. So you get excitement from helping the that homeless guy and giving him $5 or buying him a sandwich downstairs. And you take that excitement that anybody would get, and normally it dissipates for them, you take that excitement and try to move it into the next day or the next hour or whatever. Conceptually, yes. And, and it, it, what's funny is that my my example is somewhat flawed because I probably wouldn't give him a sandwich or I'd probably show him how to make his own sandwich. Give a man a fish versus teach a man a fish is very much a principle that I live by. Right? How would you teach him? I mean, that's why that's why that's why I think it's a, it's slightly flawed. But the 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 in terms of the the specific example, it's more to demonstrate this concept of by helping that one homeless guy then it could lead to, it starts the momentum for yourself, maybe for other people to do it again another day and another day or maybe now to say, well, let's not just do one person, let's do five people. And then that's the, so that's the, the definition of this help one, help many. And, and the, theoretically, conceptually, if I say to every single person, and I do this when I, when I give talks, I'll say, listen, everybody in this room, go help one person in the next week or two weeks or, or month. And then everybody, now think about that. If everybody helped one person, could everybody do that? Yes, we could do that. Great. Now look around the room, how many people are in this room? How many people would be helped if you did just that? And all of a sudden, it's kind of like the blinders come off and the, and the, and the smoke clears. And you're like, holy crap, this could, this could really be meaningful. Now, it could be just kind of a, boop, a bip on the radar and go away, but maybe something catches on. So that's the, the – when I look at these stories with Tempt or with, with the iRider or Daniel – with the arm or with any of the other things or or Don with the the voice device that we made for him. To it, tell me about that. What did you do with the voice device? It was actually it's incredibly simple and that's that's very much a principle of a lot of things we do. We're not trying to create like a, a pocket nuclear fission device. We're we're trying to create things that we see that we consider to be absurd that aren't accessible. Right. So I look at something and go, wait a second, there's a paralyzed guy. He's not able to draw or communicate again. There's lots of things like that that exist. They're just cost prohibitive. They shouldn't be cost prohibitive. Let's change that. Let's hack that and let's modify it so it's it's affordable. So there's absurd. So you try to bridge the gap between the absurd, which is someone who desperately needs help and someone who's not necessarily uncommon from millions of other people around the world. And you try to make the technology that already exists acceptable. So you bridge that gap. Yes. So accessibility is, is, a, is a governing aspect of what we do. We're not trying to create the next $700 pill. We're trying to create something that totally disrupts a particular fill in the blank. Maybe it's a way of communication, a way of, of transportation, you know, in terms of mobility or things like that. Bring that down so that it's accessible. Tell the story, 
help one, help many, tell the story of one person, how it changes that one person's life so that other people have that ability to relate to it and say, oh, wait a second, my uncle, my my aunt or my brother has that same syndrome or someone in my community has that, maybe this can actually help them as well. So it's almost like you use story to help to bridge the gap between the one and the many. So if you tell the story of the one, you're going to A, inspire people to help the many, and B, you might, um, people who have no idea who you are or, or anything might say, oh, okay, I can do this for the people I know like that. So like, let's take the story of, of Daniel. So this is, uh, how did he, how did he lose his arms? So Daniel was out, he is a, uh, he was a 12 year old Sudanese boy living in the Nuba Mountains. Uh, the Nuba Mountains is a region between South Sudan and Sudan. President Bashir, the president of Sudan, who's the same guy that brought you the atrocities of Darfur. Nice regu- guy. Yeah, really. He's the only, he's actually the only current political leader who has international war crimes against him, and he's still in power. How come they can't just, like, fly in and scoop him up? That's probably three more podcasts for us to talk about. Okay. That. And I won't claim to be able to understand that, but to me, that seems somewhat logical that you would do that. But uh, balance of power, I think, is the is the short answer. So he regularly runs this campaign of terror across the people of the Nuba Mountains, meaning he runs these, these old Antonov you know, uh, Russian turboprop planes over, they spill open the back cargo door and they roll 55 gallon drums filled of jet fuel and and metal shards and shrapnel. It hits the ground, it splays shrapnel everywhere. And if you're hit by it, you're obviously, that's what hurts you or maims you or decapitates you or, or, you know, amputates you. But there's foxholes everywhere. So people, because they can hear these planes coming from miles and miles away. So people flee, they go into caves, they go into these foxholes. Daniel was out tending his family's uh, herd, goats and cows, heard the planes, didn't know where to go, didn't have any place, wrapped his arms around a tree, bomb went off, the tree protected his body from the blast, but his arms were on the other side of the tree and the blast blew off his arms. Mm-hmm. So that's how he lost it. How did he survive after that? Like, did somebody come to help and it was patch a, him It up? was a miracle. Like, someone found him, and it took him, I think, eight hours to get to Dr. Tom, uh, Dr. Tom Katana, who's the doctor in um, the Nuba Mountains, who's the only doctor in the Nuba Mountains there. And he is, just for, so we're super clear, he is, as far as I'm concerned, a modern-day Mother Teresa. He is, he talks little, and he does a lot. He's the most incredible human being I've ever met. So, so, so Daniel lost his arms and was incapacitated essentially. Like he couldn't probably do most things, you know, that we take for granted in life. You heard about the story and then what was your first reaction? Well, what I read when I read this, this article, um, by Alex Perry in time, and I'm just, this is like 1130 at night as I'm reading this article and I'm scrolling down and then I see that picture of Daniel and it's like, oh, and then I scroll down and it says that uh, when Daniel woke up and realized that he was now an armless Sudanese boy, and it's hard enough to stay alive in Sudan with arms, uh, when he realized he was an armless Sudanese boy, he said, if I could die, I would. I'm now going to be such a burden to my family. Hmm. And to me... How did his family react to that? His family was was gone. I mean, that that's, this, is, this is an area where people get dispersed and spread out all over the place. So... Um, that to me was just a huge kick in the gut. Like I couldn't imagine my kids waking up and saying that. So that was the, all right, here we go. And that that actually kicks in one of the things that that I live by and that we live by at Non Impossible, which is you commit and then you figure out how the heck you're gonna pull it off. So so And that was as soon as I read that, I said, I gotta do something. So so just to be clear. I just kind of kind of want to give a little background and continue the story. You run Not Impossible Labs, which kind of is devoted to solving these types of projects. And in addition to that, you run other companies, the Evelyn Group, uh, and you do production. You've you've done the title sequence for uh, one of the Double Seven movies. I always forget the title. Quantum of Solace. Quantum of Solace, which I saw by the way in two thousand eight. Yep. Yeah, so great title sequence. Thank you. I remember Thank very you. well. I hated the movie. I love the title sequence. Title, yeah, a lot of people said that. My my my, the worst my, James Bond my, movie my good ever. friends at MK12 are the ones that did that. So that's uh, with me. So that was awesome. Um, what was the last thing you say? You you commit. You commit, and then you figure it out. And, and that's it. and that's the principle of, of not impossible. So not impossible labs was founded after the I writer, what I would call the I writer happening or the high writer phenomenon, which is we we met this paralyzed graffiti artist we decided that we were just gonna we were gonna just write a check we were just gonna give him five bucks for the sandwich and we sat down with his father and brother and said hey we're gonna give you this money because i 
after kind of Christmas time, we decided to, in lieu of giving our clients gifts, we're going to give a donation in their name. And his father and brother said, you know, when I said, what are you going to use the money for? They said, we just want, we just want to talk to tempting and we just want to be able to communicate with him. And that was that moment of recognizing that absurdity of like, wait a second, it's absurd that you can't talk. Stephen Hawking can talk, Christopher Reeves, all these guys, this the technology exists. Why can't you talk? And he said, because we don't have insurance and money. And I said, well, that's ridiculous. How do we change that? And so we went and started to hack and I ended up meeting some people and, you know, I committed right there that we would change it and not knowing any concept of ocular recognition technology, but the commitment to try to create an ability for a father and a brother to be able to talk to their son and brother was bigger than the actual knowing how to do it. And then you just start go looking, going looking for it. So that is essentially the principle of what Non Impossible Labs does. We recognize these absurdities and then through our mantra of technology for the sake of humanity. So we create technology that accomplishes a fundamental human and social need, and then we figure out how to make that hyper accessible to people. So, so what if, um, uh, and we keep, we, we keep going on tangents, but I want to get back to all the sure. stories. What if you commit to something, but then something else occurs where you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to put that on the side and I'm going to commit to this other bigger thing. Like, does that ever happen or you ever get tempted? Um, in the middle of yes. a, a quest, yes, there'll be things that we'll we'll have like a slate because I I ultimately see myself as a as a storyteller is like we'll have a slate of stories that we're telling because the power of what we do is in obviously the technology that we create. But if I tell if I make an amazing piece of technology, but you don't hear about it, then it doesn't do anything. You know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, it does not make a sound. And that's my opinion. So we, I have to tell that powerful story. So we'll have a slate of stories that we're telling, and one might need more love, or two might need more love than the other, and so we'll put more gas on that fire, and then maybe put one on hold for a second, and then resume. And so, so again, I want to I want to express the notion of what I call a micro charity, which is again, um, and I think everybody can make use of this. Doesn't matter how much money you have or how much access you have, you can find situations that personally you can help as opposed to writing a check. And Absolutely. I think that's a really important concept, which is starting to happen more and more as people independently try to solve problems as opposed to kind of outsourcing it to these large charitable organizations where nobody knows what happens to the money. And I'm sure they're all doing good, but I think it does have that good feeling when you can go in and do it yourself. So, and I, and think, I think that there's a spirit, I think, un, and, and in a very, I think, non-confrontational way and peaceful way, there's a bit of anarchy in terms of how we operate, is that I don't necessarily believe that you need to wait for big government or big business or big insurance or big medical to wait for them to give you permission to solve your problems. Right. You can take, what we're proving is that you can take on those problems yourself. It might not be the most polished. Steve Jobs probably would not be incredibly happy with the, the final kind of quality of the, of the output in terms of aesthetics. But if it accomplishes a fundamental need that you have, and then you're able to share that because of the way the world works now with the way the information is shared, someone's gonna see it and they're gonna say, well, I can make that better. And our, that we want people to say that. And then they iterate, and then they iterate, and they iterate, as opposed to waiting for your insurance permission code to come through so that you can go get some overpriced, ridiculously marked up piece. And that, my, that criticism isn't necessarily pointed at one particular entity. It's just kind of what has happened in terms of the bureaucracy of being able to actually get help or to do things that you need. So I say, awesome, just ignore it, dismantle it completely and go do it yourself. Right, and how that kind of, that disruption solves your problem and it hopefully inspires other people to go do it as well. So, so, so if you had just let kind of the system uh, do its work, these people would still be, you know, Daniel would still have no arms and Temp would still not be able to communicate with his brother and father. So I want to get back to those stories, okay. but I want to reel back a little bit again on the secret origin. Like, obviously, you've been very creative all your life. You've been doing lots of things, and now you have these resources to help people. Now, it doesn't have to be Bill Gates resources, but enough resources to to go out and say, okay, I'm going to commit to this worldwide adventure, which is going to save this little kid's life. So, so how did that start? Like what, where, 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 where the hell are you from? <laughs> um, so I, I actually was funny. I was out to dinner with someone last night and we got on, oh, the, we got you on didn't this topic <laughs> and we got tomorrow, tonight, I'll skip my flight. We'll go out to dinner tonight. So 
there was something that happened, and I and I write about this a little bit in the book because I think it's when I when I sat back and looked at it, this is this is one of those fundamental kind of milestones. But my family used to go on camping trips. I come from a you know middle class family, grew up in Arizona, uh, lived in a track home over in Tempe, Arizona. And every year we would take the same two weeks off. We would tow our trailer from Air Phoenix through the Four Corners and get to an area in Southern Colorado, and we would go camping. And camping was our thing that we did, and we loved it. It was a it was a wonderful way to spend a vacation. But every time that we would pack up to leave, my dad would say, "Okay, guys, here's 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 bags. Go pick up all the trash in our campground, and whether it's ours or not, and there usually wasn't any trash that we had left there, but." also go to the surrounding campgrounds. And my brother and I would bitch and moan, and my dad would say, listen, if everybody left their campsite cleaner than when they found it, then all the campsites would be clean, and there wouldn't be any trash to pick up. And it was one of those words of wisdom I don't think that really hit me until much, much later in life. I'm like, wait a second. I guess if you just, I think that's where the origin of the help one help many came from is if if you just go help one person, that's one campsite. And if you leave that just a little bit cleaner, and everybody does that, then you leave the world a little cleaner of a place, a little better of a place. So I think that, you know, if I've, and, I, and I've thought about it, I obviously wrote about it. And that, I think, is the genesis of where this all happened. And then I got a chance to see my mom and my dad go and do these things and got a chance to see these, these stories of these people whose lives were affected by what had happened. And that was an amazing story, but then how that affected other people and that residual kind of spiral effect that everything started to kind of splinter off. That to me is just an incredible phenomenon that that you can't really replicate any other way that I can see. Right on a on a personal level, meaning like y- you you going out and helping these people provide you know obviously it helps people and it help, helps one and then it helps many through your storytelling, but it also helps you a lot. Like you're you get this amazing kind of almost superhuman benefit from it that gives you energy for the next one and gives you inspiration and brings people together under a common umbrella, which is your not impossible labs and maybe other umbrellas that you don't even know exist. And that keeps this movement going almost. I don't mean to call it a movement, but it almost could no, be. No, I actually, we, we want this to be a movement because there are all the things that not impossible is touching right now. And we're playing in the space of of, of of cerebral palsy and and blindness and deafness and uh, there's a whole suite of different things that we're playing in. But what those are the things that the projects that we're going to touch. And like you just asked me, well, what happens if one project needs more love than another? And I said, well, that one I'll kind of pull back the the gas a little bit on one and put it more on the other. Well, I don't think that that's fair to all the projects in the world that need to happen. So, non impossible is very much a way of thinking. I want people to think that wait a second. If that bald guy can do it, you know, he doesn't have a PhD. He doesn't have any special degrees. If he can go do it, then certainly I can go do that. And I want people to be reminded that they already have permission to go do these things. That's I do so not, important. I do not have any special qualifications. So it's, it's like just everyone has permission. Everybody, everybody has permission. Everybody but, has permission to go do I this. But I will say you've been very successful. You sold one company in the 90s. Um, you have a, a successful production company now. So you're able to apply some of those resources into not, like how does not impossible kind of raise the money to do the things you need to do. Not that you need money to feed the guy on the sidewalk, but you do need money to fly across to Sudan to Sudan and to get the resources needed sure. to help Daniel and, and the 3D printers and the, the, the prosthetics. Now, admittedly, I read the story. You did everything super cheap because you want to make it accessible, but that also requires some brain resources that you're able to use. So the, the business model, so Not Impossible Labs is not a nonprofit. We have... A foundation that people can donate money to and people do because sometimes people just want to write a check and that's fantastic and so we'll apply those resources to to helping us accomplish some of the things that we want to do but not impossible labs the model around that is comes from my background which is in advertising and marketing and production so what we do the, the from a business perspective is that we 
start to create the iWriter. We start to create the Project Daniel story and the, and the, and the invention that's going to help, which is essentially kind of the main actor, if you will, or the main kind of focal point of that particular story around helping that one person. We'll take that and then we'll go to brands. We'll go to Intel or to HP or to Microsoft or to automobile companies or things like that. And we'll say to them, listen, we have this incredible story and this incredible thing that we're going to do. We think that you should get behind this. And let, let me ask you, go, you say you go to Intel. Who do you call at Intel? Who returns your call? It's, we go through the door of the, of the marketing. Like, so we go through the CMO's office. And so that you say to the CMO, listen, because they get calls all the time. Listen, we have a great project you should be involved in. Right. So how do you get past that initial defense? Well, that l- luckily, have? luckily now we have a track record. So Project Daniel literally won every advertising and marketing award that there was to enter. We, we, we typically, the life cycle of advertising awards is this, this is like a fiscal year from when the award season starts. We start, we won it for like a year and a half. People like there were awards that we won one year and then we won the next year as well. So now that we have that track record, we can walk into those offices and say, we won can, we won the one show, we won AICP, we won the tellies, we won the Andes, we won, we won all of these things. And what does that mean? Did we do it to win those awards? Absolutely not. But no, since but we won credibility. those awards, now we say to them, we have another story, and we think that this story is going to have the same kind of the gist, the same core to that. This is good for your brand. And that's, our, that's the conversation we have with these CMOs is we say, doing good is good for your brand. It's good for your who you are. It's good for your shareholder value because now people are going to start to re- create that correlation of Intel and making arms for, for, for kids. And it's if you look at the way that that story that story was sold, or I'm sorry, it was shared, within 14 weeks of Project Daniel launching, with zero paid media, so no nobody paid for any any views, we had 420 million earned media impressions. Oh my gosh! That was from press and blogs, and the if you look at the demographics of who picked it up, it was retirement communities down to mommy bloggers down to uh down to like schools so it it was had this massive range demographically because it was about the story of daniel the humanity of this little boy who fed himself for the first time in two years and that that broaches all kind of demographical boundaries intel launched their campaign and we popped over a billion media impressions within 10 months so now when i sit across from a cmo and say listen i'm not promising you that everything is going to get a billion media impressions in in 10 months but that's the that's the that's the heart of the stories that we tell and these are the things that we want to do with you but let's say i'm going to do this or let's say a listener is going to do this and they want to make that first call that they're ever going to make to a cmo what should they say well, this is our, our model, and I'm, I'm incredibly transparent about this, is that I, we don't call the CMO, we don't call someone who controls kind of the storytelling of a brand and say, I want to do this, can you help me? We call and say, we're doing this, we've already started it, the train has left the station, Love it. would you like to get on board? And that just, that slight shift is so powerful. Why do you think it's so powerful? Because everybody wants to go to the party they haven't been invited to. And I think also people trust you more if you say we're already doing this as opposed to, hey, we're not doing anything, please help me. How many ideas have you been pitched where you're like, that ah, sounds like a great idea. And your but voice done nothing. And your voice goes up, which means, how was your date last night? Oh, it was nice, which means right. it wasn't that nice, right? right? It, but if someone's like, hey, I'm doing this, and this is what's going on, and then people are like, oh wow, let's let's let me know more about that. So, so this is like your 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 abilities and skills as a producer. You're able to kind of line up the 30 or 40 things you need to do to begin as quickly and easily as possible. Right. And then you that gives you the power to say, we're already doing this. You know, they, they say all, all you ever learned, you learn in kindergarten, that book. Yeah. All I ever learned. I learn from being a producer, which is you take on things that there's you have no right. But you're like a super producer. You're like, you know, you, you could get into any situation and say, okay, I need X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and then you kind of start to gather it together. I think that's the mentality of a producer, though, is that you're constantly, you have curveballs coming at you from not just one pitcher, but from five pitchers around you, and you have to sit there and swing and try to figure out how to hit them all. But, but that's a very much like 
choose yourself or give yourself permission kind of personality. Because a lot of people will say, well, I can't do that because the head of this organization said I can't. Sure. And so you have to go, a producer has to go and say, well, they won't let me use the streets, so I'm going to build a set that looks like the street or whatever. Right. There, so, there has to be a refusal. I think at its core, what Not Impossible is, if you look at the kind of the dogma of Not Impossible, that statistically every single thing that exists on our planet right now was impossible at one point. Like what? Give me an example of that. Everything. That's like, let's, let, let's look about the room. The microphones that are in front of us, did those already? Did those always exist? Was there a point in somewhere along the line where someone said, you know what would be really great is if there was a device that could capture a voice and really capture it purely and then transfer it into, that'd be a great, that, that didn't exist at one point. And then someone did it and guess what? Now, do you even think about how fantastic a microphone is or a cell phone or a car right. or an airplane? No, it's just you accept it. So if once you really study life and look at life and say every single thing was impossible until when? Until it was possible. And then all of a sudden, boom, then it goes back to that thing of permission. Now people start to iterate on that. And like, well, first you had the plane, but then you went from, from single prop to, turbo, to, to double prop and then to turbo prop and then to jet and then to da da da. And then it starts to iterate. And that's that it sets this course of permission for people to invent and to improve. Well, it's interesting because it's not quite that these things were impossible when they were made. It's what Steven Johnson refers to as the adjacent possible. So it's like if Leonardo da Vinci mapped out um, drawings of a plane in the whatever year he was around, uh, it was it really was impossible then, but it became the adjacent possible around the 1880s when you know people were playing with different technologies with the industrial revolution and bicycles sure. and so on. So the Wright brothers were able to create a wobbly bicycle-like plane, right? You know, from a bicycle store. Right. It reminds me of that because who would get? They were up against the government. They were just two brothers who ran a bicycle store, but it was part of the adjacent possible as opposed to the impossible, right? Because the technology was all there, and that's what you do. So let's let's dive into the story of Daniel now. So you you go in there, you kind of see what what happened next. You saw what he needed. What was it? I saw it. I saw the 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 story. I saw what he said. I saw what Doctor Tom was doing. And I just, I said, I got to do something. I closed my computer and I went to bed and that started the process of, all right. Um, and, and this is kind of a phenomenon. If I said to you, all right, what was the first car that you ever had growing up? What was the first car you ever, I know you're a New Yorker, so you yeah. might, you, I know that answer is actually, you might be, I never I owned a car. I don't, I've never, um, <laughs> I, I think that might be the wrong question. Okay. All right. So then I'll I, say, I actually it. don't drive. and I have a suspended driver's license. So. Okay. <laughs> all right, well, totally wrong question. <clears throat> my first car that I can kind of, that I have a, an emotional connection to was an Isuzu Trooper, which are those old boxy, you know, kind of one inch thin doors. You close them and it goes ding when it closes. I bet you the, the part of the listeners out there right now, somebody had an Isuzu Trooper, right? Yeah. And I know that when you, when I drive by an Isuzu Trooper and I live in Los Angeles now, so I, you know, I get, I get in a car a lot. Nobody else, if you didn't have an Azusa Trooper, you don't recognize that. You don't see that. But I do because that was something I had. Like I owned International Scouts, which is another kind of car that most people would just not even think about. So once you start to have the awareness of something that you need or that you are looking for, you start to see it. And I'm not, this isn't some kind of hocus pocus, sure. you know, cultish thing. It's just fact. You start to become aware of things that are at the top of your mind. So a couple months prior to that, we had done an article about an incredible guy named Richard Van Oss, who was a carpenter in South Africa who accidentally cut his fingers off in a table saw accident, went to hit the hospital, got all stitched up, said, hey, can I get a pro some prosthetic, uh, prosthetic hand, prosthetic fingers? And they said, that's, you know, you know, because you can't afford it. It was, it was too expensive. And he said, well, then I'm going to go make it myself. And he went back and he created 3D printed fingers and a 3D kind of um, handmade prosthetic for himself. Okay, let me ask you about that. So he used whatever materials a 3D printer uses. He created something that looked like fingers. How did he know how to attach it to his nerves so that they would work? There's no nerves. It's all mechanical. That's, th that's, that's because he was a carpenter. So he deals in the practicality of life, right? He deals, he's not some neuro fill in the blank. He's not some doctor who's going in. He looked at the mechanics and the engineering of how the hand works. And literally what he ended up creating 
as everybody can see on this podcast, is that if you take your wrist and you bend your wrist when you do that, if you've got strings that are attached to the tips of your fingers that are then anchored higher up on your arm and you bend that wrist, it causes the strings to shorten. And if they shorten, something has to give. And if something has to give and it's hinged fingers, it causes your fingers to collapse. So just by bending your wrist up and down or down, it would cause the fingers to snap shut. So he created a way mechanically, nothing there was no motors. There was no nothing attached to the body. Mechanically, just by moving his wrist, he could con- he could collapse his fingers. I love this because I think when people think kind of what's the cutting edge of prosthetics, they think of okay, I need something perfect that looks like f- it's like Luke Skywalker at the end of Empire Strikes Back, right. where he's like moving his fingers around after Darth Vader cuts right. it off. So people think that like okay, I'm going to start feeling things again. They're going to look like fingers. It's going to be perfect. But he created something in between nothing and perfect, but it became like totally functional for him so he could like live and do his job and pay for his family and so on. And and, it and, and I think the thing is that the, you know, I always joke, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't think the end of the world is coming anytime soon, but if it was to come, I don't want the astro, I don't want people with PhDs behind their names. I want the people who know how to weld or fit pipes or yeah. cut wood because there's a practicality of that that is kind of at its base kind of what our society was built on, right? The, the trades of creation. So to me, if you look at a lot of the things that we do, which there is a technological component in many of the things we do, but technology has a greater meaning. Mechanical, you know, that's that. As far as I'm concerned, that's technology. Leverage is technology. So that's well, that's what gets created. So I saw that to 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 finish it up quickly. I saw that he did that, and I said, well, wait a second. If he could do that for fingers, maybe we could do something like that for Daniel, and that set the course of Project Daniel, and which is I invited Richard from South Africa, a bunch of guys to our house. I I also live by a philosophy is if you surround yourself with people who make you feel stupid, you're doing the right thing. You're in the right place. You said a couple things that were interesting. You said you closed your computer and you went to sleep. And I guess that kind of got the wheels spinning on what you really needed to find. Uh, You had this idea about technology and, and the mechanical aspects. You kind of searched the world for who sort of fit these criteria. You brought them together using, with Intel's help, I guess, and... Now they're on course on the mission. So what happens next? So, well, we start to create. We start to create it first, right? The chain always has to leave the station. So the project is happening one way or another. And I don't know how it's going to happen, but we're moving forward. Everybody comes to my house. We hack and create. We actually, the weekend was a total and utter failure. Nothing that we created worked. So the you train is left to just to... create uh, something that worked like at your house on a weekend. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And we were and quite frankly, we were a little bit cocky because we're like, oh, we did it with the iRider. That took us a couple weeks. We can figure this one out. And we had nothing to kind of measure off the iRider. This one, we had a little bit of an inspiration from Richard. And it was a it was a complete and utter failure. Uh, but the train had left the station. Good for when you're talking to the CMO if the train leaves the station. And it's also good for you to be like, holy cow, the, the, the car is already rolling. I have to figure out how I'm going to maneuver this thing and drive it. Did did you get close at all on any ideas? Yeah, like, we got close. There was, I mean, there's failures are never perfect, total failures. It gives you, it shows you what you can't do and it shows you what you should do better. Uh, I'm gonna, hold on, I'm gonna write that down. Okay. <laughs> Say that again, failures. Failures are never total failures. It shows you uh, what you should, shouldn't do and what you should do better. It's like feedback. Exactly. It's exactly what it is. And so. so many parts of our life, we avoid feedback, like the stable salary, for instance, or, you know, just kind of plodding along with everything else with normal life and society. We don't really get feedback. Right. So, uh, so that, and then that, I actually now, and this is a muscle that has been built over time, I celebrate when we fail because now I know. And I'm not trying to be trite about this, but now I know. No, like, because sweet, there is there is this, like a this, failure this form is good. that yeah. happens, and so, but it's good to actually kind of systematize what you do with failure. Absolutely. So, and so how you process it, and what, and like, what do you go? Where do you go from there? So I, I mean, I know the story of Daniel, and have seen all this stuff, but let me just brainstorm it for a second, because okay. it seems fun. <laughs> um, so let's say you're trying to take this guy's mechanical hands and apply that to the arms and let's say you 3d print something that looks like arms and you strap it to your chest in some way is there any way to like 
that was the th that was one of the things that we looked at. We looked at actually creating like a backpack type of situation where you could move your your scapula. You could kind of pivot your your shoulders, and that would engage and disengage the fingers. So we looked at that. We looked at a lot of things, and what we ended up going back to um, after that failure weekend, I flew out to see Richard, and he had created a thing called the Robo Arm. He first thing he created was the Robo Hand. And he created the Robo Arm, and he taught me how to do that. And it's literally the same way he created the wrist by the in flexion of the fingers or of the wrist, you contract the fingers with string. The same thing, but now it's with your elbow. So as you move your elbow, if you put your hands straight out in front of you and imagine guitar strings that run from the tip of your fingers down across your palm, across your forearm, down to your elbow, and then attach on the back of the tricep, and then your arm's perfectly straight. If you bend it to 90 degrees, if those fingers are hinged, if your knuckles are hinged, which they are, the strings pull it taut, they have to go someplace. Otherwise, you couldn't bend your arm. So as you bend your arm, it makes the fingers collapse. So it's almost like you took the hand, but then took all the technology for that, but then it just extended it out so you can get to that point where you can do the hand clasp. Right, which is back so, to the so permission. By moving... Richard gave us permission with the hand, and he took that and adopted it for a bigger body part, which is the arm. So let me try to understand, because and so people can't see, but like, so if you push your, let's say your arm back, that's gonna stretch out the... You know, just bending the elbow. How do you bend the elbow? It, well, this is not for this is not for amputees that are above the elbow. It's for amputees below the elbow. Okay. So you need to have a, a little stub, a t as small of a stub as possible, or you know, it will still work below the elbow. So that creates the ability to bend and pull the forearm back. But I bet you could even handle above the elbow we, we by could. just moving the chest around. We could, and we we didn't we weren't able to do it on this on that particular trip. But I think that there's one of the things that we've started to explore is how we might be able to do that. So two questions: one relating to Daniel, one relating to the global aspect of this. One is, does he feel phantom pain with arms that seem like they're working, but they're not quite his arms? Um, Daniel speaks Arabic, mm -hmm. and so I don't communicate with Daniel nearly. I always communicate about him through Dr. Tom. How's he doing? What's he up to? Um, at this point, I think at the stage of where he's at, and I, I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV, I think that after a certain amount of time, uh, if he did experience phantom pains, I think those start to diminish. So it's not that I know of. Psychologically or because he's got functional arms? Uh, psychologically, I mm -hmm. think, is that it starts to diminish. And uh, on a global level now, so how did this help one, help many? So you tell the story. Have other people now been able to use this contraption to, and, and does this become a for-profit thing, or do you, you? I know you open source all the technology, but have you been able to kind of enhance the arm well, the and sell it? So the distinction is not. We don't open source everything. We and I learned this was a valuable lesson that I learned with the iWriter. Open source is a way to make things accessible, but sometimes it's not the best way to make things accessible. Case in point, James, you have somebody in your life who needs an iWriter. I am going to give you the website. You can download the video on how to make it. I'll send you the list of materials that you can order from Adafruit or SparkFun, and you can get them all sent to you, and you can build it yourself, and it's going to cost you, right now, it'll probably cost you under 20 bucks, right? Not including shipping and handling. That's open source, right? Or you can click here, buy it now, and it shows up on your doorstep for, I don't know, 150 bucks. What would you that. do? I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to no, buy you, it. You, no, but what, you're going to buy it. The major at first, our philosophy around the iWriter was it must be open source, power to the people, you must make it yourself. And I, what I realized people don't want to do that. Why what, should they what's do it? the mission? Is the mission open source or is the mission to make things accessible? Accessibility is now our governing kind of ethos, making it if, if it's easier for people to click buy it now and more people can be helped and inspired to help other people, then that's kind of what the main point is. Not necessarily making people makers, making people actually go and tinker around and try to make this thing. So that was a huge distinction, is accessibility is our governor. So let, let's talk about the iWriter. So this is with the, the graffiti artist, Tim, who had ALS, and he couldn't communicate with his, his brother and his father. Um, and then this is kind of your first big project. So what, what did you do? So I, again, I committed to his father and brother. We were at the pantry downtown LA having pancakes. I asked him what they're gonna use the money for. They said, we wanna talk to their brother. I said, what do you mean? Stephen Hawking has machines. Why don't I have a Stephen Hawking machine? They said, you have to have money or insurance. I said, that's ridiculous. Let's change that. Whoop. That sets the dominoes in, in, in effect. I didn't know what we we're gonna, I committed. 
commit than figure it out. I started to figure out like, what am I going to do? I've never said the word ocular recognition technology, but now we have to figure that out. I ended up speaking at a conference on the, about the James Bond main titles. I met these guys uh, in a group called Graffiti Research Lab. They were, were hackers that did things for art sake, but they were hacking technology. Told them about Tempt. They came on board. How, how long was this like? So you, you the, to, the to total Tempt? time the total timeline was you know I met Tempt in 2008 and we made the device in 2009. So it took a while for me to figure out how to come through with this and pull all the p parts together. But these guys who definitely fit the criteria of people smarter than me flew them to my house and we hacked for about two and a half weeks and came up with this device and um, in attempt to drew again for the first time. And so, so the device was specifically uh, kind of glasses that allows you to um, use lasers to kind of make So the inspiration, Graffiti Research Lab had come up with a thing Sounds called... Sounds like Cyborg from the X-Men was the inspiration. Totally. <laughs> the Graffiti Research Lab came up with a thing called laser tag, which was an ability to draw on the side of a building with light. And it would actually, because there was a projector on the side of the building, the laser would draw through the light and it would leave a remnant on the building. But then as soon as you shut the projector off, it was gone. So it was kind of fictitious graffiti, right? So using that theory of like, well, wait a second, why don't we make it so that Tempt can draw again and he'll use light? That was the initial inspiration. And then we took that we created a device. We knew he could blink his eyes because that's how he was communicating. If you've ever seen right. the book or, or the yeah. uh, movie Diving Bell and the Butterfly, he was blinking to a letter board, which is a piece of paper with the letters on it. And that's how he would communicate with his family. So we knew that he could blink his eyes. So we said, well, let's come up with a way for him to blink his eyes, but he could move his eyes and blink his eyes. That's essentially your hand and your pencil to be able to draw. So that that's what we replicated. So after about two and a half weeks of hacking, and we'd been kind of we'd worked for throughout the the leading up to the hack the kind of the hacker weekend, we had worked on trying to create something. So we had some theories coming into it, but that's when everything congealed. He drew again, and it was this incredible euphoric moment where this man who had lost his love, his, his, his ability to draw, had it returned and everybody was partying down in the, in the parking lot where we were projecting on the side of a building and we'd had some beers afterwards and it was fantastic. But then we went home and there wasn't any grand plan for us to do much more except for let's make it a little bit better and Temp can draw. But all of a sudden things just started to spire like just snowball and it boom 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 people started contacting us and it started getting all this coverage and lo and behold you know next thing we know it was time magazine's top 50 inventions and wow. we said holy cow this is incredible and what got us and this is actually temp's story was the origin of non-impossible labs because that happened and Tempt sent me an email and I was, I was like, wow, this is really amazing. Maybe, you know, do I continue this? Do I not continue this? Was this just a one-off and do I just go back to commercial and, and, and television production and keep doing that? And he sent an email that said, that was the first time I'd drawn anything for seven years. I feel like I've been held underwater and someone finally reached down and pulled my head up so I could take a breath. Hmm. And I got that email and I said, all right, well, I guess I don't really have a choice now. I have to keep doing this. I don't know what I did. I don't know how I did it. But now we have to figure out how to replicate that. So that started Non-Impossible Labs in this pursuit of technology for the sake of humanity and focusing on one person to try to help many. So so uh, now in terms of uh, how the, the, the help many have now, how many people have now used the iWriter? How many people have used Daniel's contraption? So, so that's the thing that we haven't created a, a metrics to be able to evaluate how much we're doing because we're giving it away, we're making it accessible. We don't, we can't quantifiably say this is how many people have been helped. Well, what I can say is that we received so many emails uh, that people were like, oh, can you send us the code? We want to make it. The best email I got was an email from, it was on December 13th at five in the morning. Uh, that a group in Korea had said, oh, Mr. Eblin, we saw your iRider and we saw your TED Talk and, you know, you're, we love your work and what you're up to. Compliment, 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 which I now look back as just basically just setting you up to be able to whoosh. And they said, but we wanted to let you know that we've created something better. That's awesome. And, I, and, and my response was, that's awesome. <laughs> and, and I said, please send us the code and we'll replace the code that we have with your code. And I think they were dumbfounded of like, wait a second, they, these guys created something, but now they're willing to, to replace it. That's, that's fantastic. So that's kind of the principle of what we're doing, that this, this ability to iterate and make things better 
is the desired outcome. So this is all, and it, and it's funny because it strikes me as there's this middle area between nothing and kind of cutting edge scientists mm -hmm. where, but they, but you're actually fulfilling a need. So, Absolutely. and it's kind of within that that you can iterate and improve until you have, you don't start off with this, maybe you start off with the Sony Walkman, but then other people create, you know, the, the iPad or Why iPhone. should a vet coming back from losing his limbs in war, why should he wait for the perfect arm when he can, we can literally make one for him in a day and he can have something functional now while he's waiting for the $25,000 hammer and have, or the $100,000 arm. Use, use that? This is, these are the things that we want to see happen. And there's the amazing thing that happened from Project Daniel um, was that you start to see if you track what like the conversations around 3D prosthetics, 3D printed prosthetics prior to Project Daniel and after Project Daniel, the conversations are everywhere now, right? And are we the are we the reason that it happened? No, but we were definitely the loudest story, and we were the ones that I think made this an open conversation. With when you have over a billion media impressions, that's proof right in of itself that there's something there. And now you have fantastic groups called Enable that are purely dedicated towards 3D printing prosthetics. And you've got other people, you've got people that are doing it in schools and you probably saw the Robert Downey Jr. piece where he made, he, he took a, an Iron Man arm out for a little boy. So there's these conversations about prosthetics and prosthetics for people. I mean, I don't, I don't rem ever remember conversations about prosthetics happening a couple years back. So, so let's take me, because I always, my favorite topic, and <laughs> how can I start to have this mentality of, you know, going out there and doing doing it yourself, helping people? So, of course, there is the man on the sidewalk, and that's one thing, but I'd like to do more of what, of what you're doing. Like, how do I do that? Well, I think, first of all, you can, you know, just start to adopt or believe in this mentality that nothing is impossible, right? Like, so once you subscribe to that, and again, I'm not trying to convert anybody. Have to you a found anything to be impossible that you've set out to do? Everything is impossible before it's possible. So I'm not trying to be coy, but right. the tele teleportation, that's impossible now. Will that be impossible in the future? I would say history would say no. But, Eventually, but, we'll but figure if, that out. But if you needed to do that right now, you probably couldn't. We probably, probably, couldn't, not we probably close. couldn't do it right now, no. Right. But it will exist in the future. So if you know that everything is it's eminent that something will become possible, then you see yourself more as a catalyst as opposed to just an innocent bystander waiting for it to happen. But I guess I guess here's an interesting thing about teleportation of inanimate things is that you can say, take this bottle of water that's in front of me, put it in a machine, and a 3D printer on the other side of the country can print the exact thing, you know, once it scans yep, the CAD yep. design it's of an this. excellent point. A, so, I guess a type of teleportation already exists. Right. So, so again, I'm just thinking of the adjacent possible, sure. where we have the technology to do what appears to be teleportation, but not exactly teleportation. And I would say, again, to, you know, my concept of teleportation is I can't wait for us to be able to do that with human beings, where I could take, you know... Mick, Mick Ebeling, who has cancer, and we can, you know, teletransport me into a different place, but we're just going to leave out the bad stuff, so I get to reassemble on the other side. Is that going to happen? I don't know. Let's see if, if the science fiction films predict it, because science fiction is a perfect prediction of the future. Right. So one thing is nothing's impossible, or at least kind of try to figure your way, your way around. You don't need permission to sort of attack the impossible. So what's the next step? Like, do you keep your eyes out, like, kind of like Superman looking from above? Like, yes. you keep your eyes out for, like, <laughs> the situations that need your help? You look for, to, to, to kind of, to take what you've said, you look for the adjacent possible. And what I call it is morsels of permission. You look for these little bits of things like, well, wait a second, it's possible here, and it's possible there, and it's possible there. What if I assemble those together, and I take the parts that work, all those little bits of permission, put them into one pile, that gives me permission to do it. You should so, almost, like, assemble your library of stuff of adjacent possibles so that other people could access that because that seems like a valuable open source. Absolutely. It, and that's one of the things that we do. So we'll start to, I, so James, I would say to you, start to look for the things that have an emotional connection to you. Like what actually moves you? What, when you read about it or see it actually makes you go, ah, I need to do something about that, right? Whatever it might be. And then start to say, all right, well, what can I do? And if you think about that and and start to just, again, look for the Isuzu Trooper, look for the, look for the car, the, the, the international scout look for the things that 
just be aware of those things. You'll start to have those things introduced. Start to aggregate people who are experts and start to talk to those people and just have that forward momentum constantly about what you're going to do. But I guess the key thing is that that could be quantified as just research and it yeah, could be docile. It, hang on. It's docile research where you're just kind of passively yeah. researching it. But it's knowing that this is this is leading to action and you're pushing forward with action and going ahead and trying to do some things that quite frankly might fail. But that act of doing something and failing is actually still forward movement. But it seems it seems like your forward movement was always motivated by a story, by a situation that that moved you. Well, so how do you keep your eye out for the situations that are going to move you? The that's the help one help many. As I I don't if I ask you, hey, let's cure this, let's solve this. That's going to be from I think from most people is bigger than what they're a, they're capable of taking on. It's surely bigger bigger than I can take on. But if I say, hey. Here, let's t- let's help this one person, and that one person represents a population, a community of people that have that same need. That's much more quantifiable and achievable for the individual. So, so two points there. One is, it's I like the strict boundaries. Like you're not going to go out and solve, for instance, uh, the political refugee problem in Syria, for instance, because it's not the help one, help money. It's helping too many at the same time, and you might not have the resources or all the governments aligned and so on. But um, how do you find, though, the ones that inspire you? Do you just constantly read the paper or? Yeah, I think, I mean, nowadays you just kind of, you have so much content and media that's being thrown at you. I think it's just being, you know, you start to gravitate towards those particular, towards those particular things and you start to see who could potentially be there and is there something that catches your eye? So, so what are you working on like this second that's like a new thing? This second right now, uh, we are working on a thing called Music Not Impossible. And Music Not Impossible is a invention that we came up with because I was, again, I was online and I was studying and learning about this particular uh, deaf rapper, you know, a, a hear, he, hearing impaired, <laughs> right? Not D-E-F, D-E-A-F. And uh, at his concerts, people would come to other deaf people would come to his concerts and they he had he would turn to take the levels down really low. And if you were close to the speakers, you could feel the music. Right. So it was a it was a sensory experience as opposed to an audible experience. And a friend of mine had actually was married to a, a, a woman who was deaf and he would take balloons to concerts so she could actually feel the vibration of the music within the balloons. So I said, well, wait a second. Hang on. If that exists. Why don't and you, and if you're if you are are deaf or profoundly deaf you, you you can if you can't experience music unless going to a you go to a concert why don't we replicate that so what we've created is we've translated musical signals we've separated those musical signals out so that you've got maybe vocals and drums and bass and guitar and or you know keyboards whatever it might be and we've we've done it much more complicated by that but just looking at those levels and then we've sent those into a a, a wearable technology that reads those different parts in different places on your body so we've translated music from a purely audio file into a haptic file. So now you have these little micro motors that are located different places on your body and those translate the signals of the song into your uh, something that's on your body. So the experience of music is now felt and we did it for uh, for a deaf performer and you can see the you can see the video online. Um, but let me ask you a question like are people who are listeners then are they getting the same? Do you have a sense that they're getting the same joy and pleasure from the song as like other people who are actually hearing the song? Well, that was kind of the big aha moment is that the, the people, Mandy, the deaf performer who experienced this, you can see in the video that she loses her breath. She's like, oh, my God, this is so cool. She's now truly ex- feeling the music for the first time in a way that's not just what she would typically have to do, which is put her hands on on a um on a keyboard or put our hands on something that could vibrate. Now it was actually translated into her body. But what we realized is that the person who actually can hear, this heightens the experience of music to basically go into a, a show. And now you're listening to music and feeling the music viscerally on your I kind of want to get this haptic suit. I I'm going to wear you, it around all the time. Maybe the, a, just the crowds of the city. I want to ha- feel the uh, Well, here's the, noise. the So here's the cool thing. It started off with a help one, help many, right? Like how can we help a deaf person experience music. Then we realized the commercial applications of this have just for the regular consumer have massive ramifications. 
Now we're excited because we're all already coming full circle. We think that there might be some ways that this might actually be able to, and this is purely theoretical on the record. We haven't tested this yet, but we're very excited how this actually might be a way to help people who are experiencing some kind of anxiety or some kind of, of medical, uh, mental illness or physical how? illness. Um, we just we haven't proven it yet, but we believe that there might be a way that through kind of haptic um, vibrations that might be able to improve um, or or lessen anxiety or lessen uh, or improve heart rates. Like, you why know? do you think that though? Um, when you listen to a good song, does your heart beat a little a little, bit, a little stronger? You know, if you're yeah, if you're like getting pumped up by Rocky, yeah. does your heart rate go up a little bit? Yeah, so okay. you're saying to enhance the experience, even for fully hearing people. Uh, that enhancement. Maybe, maybe we can help our veterans that mm -hmm. come back with PTSD. Maybe mm -hmm. we can come back and there's a way for us to kind of balance that those highs and lows that people think through actually touching their body. And again, now now I'm waxing philosophical on this, but imagine, no, but it's imagine a good if, way to imagine. imagine if we could remove people popping pills. To, to lessen anxiety, and it could be something that's a sensory experience instead. It, you know, maybe it's a mixture of both, but maybe there's a way for us to do that. And so to me, that's what gets me really excited about Music Not Impossible. It started the one was for Mandy. Now we've come into something that I think has commercial ramifications, and if it comes for a circle and now we can actually create something that can actually help people, then that's, I mean, that's the penultimate. So you, keep, you keep leading me to other questions. Like, do, when you first started doing all this, was your imagination stretching to that level? where you could start realizing, uh, like, going from a uh, helping a deaf person experience music to let's solve PTSD for war veterans using the same technology and reduce anxiety. Like, that's a big stretch of the imagination. And were you doing those kind of stretches before or, or through the process of doing all these projects, have you really started to explore, yeah. like... What's the po what is the possible? So here's here's the crazy thing, and this is, goes back to that concept of permission and morsels of permission. So no, I didn't think about I didn't think that way at first. But the more projects I do, the more I start to see things of what ramifications they could have in other areas. But now, if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, I just heard that crazy bald guy talk, and he's talking about that and about they can't using see you, so I don't know. Okay, but, well. <laughs> Uh, but now they, the listeners, can now say, well, wait a second. I listened to his podcast or I read his book or I watched his videos. And now they kind of get that advancement of like, all right, well, now I can be as crazy as this guy was. And they can take it and run with it from there. They can iterate on, on things that I've thought of. And they'll probably take it further and farther. And that's what I think I'm most excited about the work that I'm doing right now is that baked into this is this – absolute foundation of humility that I might come to, come up with something that is that I think is really cool or really smart or really revolutionary, but I know that a second later someone can iterate and improve upon that. And that I think keeps everybody's kind of narcissism and, and, and humanity in check so that you can kind of keep propelling things forward. So, so it's not only not asking for, for permission, it's also giving up control. So having this, like you, you mentioned this humility, but having this sort of sense of surrender to the things you create with the idea that it's going to um, help help the world and iterate and make your business better as well. Yes, so absolutely. So the one, ch so I want to leave people with a couple challenges. One is I want people to read your book. I've read it, but I'm always bad with titles. It's not impossible. The art and joy of doing what couldn't be done. Did you feel like bad doing a double negative with not impossible? <laughs> yes. As opposed to just calling it possible? <laughs> uh, no, because this is about taking things. It's very intentional. Uh, and you can go to notimpossible.com and see all the stories that we're up to. But it's about taking the impossible and making it not impossible. So it's actually negating the bad. And, and what's your Twitter account? Uh, Mick Ebling. Mick Ebling. M-I-C-K-E-B-E-L-I-N-G. -E -E so what I, what I hope listeners do, and I'm going to try to do this as well, is let's, I hope I listen to this and re-listen to it and help someone today and tweet to Mick who, who or what you did to help people today. I would love that. So go, go, do that for Not Impossible, at Not Impossible, and at Mick Ebling. And in fact, that's one of the things that we want to do is imagine if everybody started tweeting Hey, this is how I help someone today. I bought a guy a sandwich. I gave a kid a sh you know some shoes. Whatever I mean, imagine what that could do when people are like, well, I could do that. That's my morsel of permission. I can actually take that and run with it. That could be James. I would love that. that and would be I, amazing. I, I think also r tweet what the effect was on you, like how you you felt that excitement. Like I think that would be really exciting for people to see also the benefits that accrue to both sides of the of this. 
So, well, Mick, thanks so much for joining me. I know you you, you flew in all the way from California to New York just to come on my podcast. And no <laughs> other reason to come to New no York. No reason at all. And I really appreciate it. So thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com. And get yourself on the free insiders list today. Your daily dose of gaming just got way more epic with the Snapdragon processor powering the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. Snapdragon processors give you the premium mobile experience that triggers your inner champion. Whenever you want, wherever you want. Get ready for edge-of-your-seat performance, advanced customizations, ultra-realistic graphics, and adrenaline-boosting speeds that have the power to move you in more ways than one. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.